All right, well, good evening. Can I have you turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John 5? 1 John chapter 5. By God's grace, we'll finish 1 John tonight, but I make no promises. But, uh, you know, because of uh, Christmas Day and New Year's Day, it's been three weeks since we last met, since we were last in 1 John. And uh, at that time, we got as far as verse 8, but let's back up to verse 6, just to kind of refresh our memories. And John goes on to say, This is He who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Now John's wrapping up this epistle. And... Um, he starts chapter 5 by giving us one more time the qualities uh, or characteristics of those who are genuinely saved. We talked about that last time. And then he zeroes in on, you know, Jesus uh, and the testimony that um, God gave of him, uh, that he is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. Now, as we said last time, verses 6 through 8, uh, have been a source of controversy and debate among Christians for many, many years. But uh, before we look at the actual words that appear or actually don't appear in these verses when compared with New Testament manuscripts, and I'm not going to, I'm just going to touch on this, okay? I want to look briefly at the basic thought John is presenting here, and then we'll touch on some of those other things we uh, talked about last time. He's telling us how we can know that Jesus is really the Son of God and Savior of the world. And he says we can know that based on the testimony of three powerful witnesses. Let me read verses 7 to 8 one more time. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Now, if you're reading anything but the King James or the New King James, right now you're horrified because my Bible has more words than your Bible. Okay? We talked about this briefly last time. If you're reading anything but the King James or the New King James, your Bible says something along these lines. I'll read out of the ESV. Verse 7, For there are three that testify, verse 8, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. Now, last time I mentioned how most of the modern translations of this passage leave out what the King James and New King James includes, and that is the end of verse 7 and the beginning of verse 8. I didn't tell you why the translations leave them out. Let me read you something from a scholar, and again, I will this down. Um, it's something that you really should have a working knowledge of, not memorize, not be able to debate. But, you know, your margin has some notes in it. Uh, these, this is not in the best manuscripts or whatever. And it gives you the words that, uh, you know, are included in my translation, New King James, but you don't maybe have in the NIV or the ESV or some other translation. So let me just, one author put it well, I thought, uh, under the heading, a few words on, on this text regarding the notes in the margins or footnotes of many Bibles regarding 1 John 5, 7, and 8. He starts out, the New King James Bible makes a marginal note on 1 John 5, verses 7 and 8, starting or stating that the words, and he quotes now, in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness on the earth, and then that's where it stops. He says these are words that are not included in the vast majority of New Testament Greek manuscripts. The words in question occur in no Greek manuscript until the 14th century, except for one 11th century and one 12th century manuscript in which they have been added to the margin by someone else's hand. So not by the person who originally copied it, 
but another scribe that came along later and put it in the margin. He said, in the first few hundred years of Christianity, there were many theological debates regarding the exact nature and understanding of the Trinity. In all of those debates, no one ever once quoted these words in question from 1 John 5, 7 and 8. If they were originally written by John, it seems very strange that no early Christian would have quoted them. In fact, though none of the ancient Christians quote from this verse, several of them do quote from 1 John 5, verse 6 and from 1 John 5, verse 8. Why skip verse 7, especially if it is such a great statement of the Trinity, if it was there in the original, is the idea. He said, in all ancient translations, the Syriac, Arabic, Ethiopian, Coptic, Sahatic, Armenian, Slovenian, and so forth, this disputed passage is not included. Only in the Latin Vulgate does it appear. It is probably best to regard these words as the work of an overzealous copyist who thought that the New Testament needed a little help with the doctrine of the Trinity. And he figured this was a good place to do it. Or perhaps the words just started as notes written in the margin of a manuscript, but the next person who copied the manuscript thought they must belong to the text itself, so he included it. While there is no explicit, explicit statement of the Trinity uh, in the statement such as this, uh, in other words, this is a, a very clear statement of the Trinity. Problem is it's not in the original, okay? Now, don't panic, said because there are many places in the New Testament, of course, old too, but many places in the New Testament where we see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together as equal, distinct uh, persons. And then he gives numerous passages. You can come up here and uh, copy them if you'd like, or if you go online tomorrow, uh, my notes will be up online. You can copy them that or, or, uh, or pull it down. Uh, make make a, uh, a print of it. Um, he goes on to say, how did these words ever get included if they are not in any ancient Greek manuscripts? The words were included in ancient Latin versions of the Bible, and in the year 1520, a great scholar named Erasmus produced a new, accurate edition of the Bible in ancient Greek. When people studied Erasmus's Bible and compared it to the Latin version, they noticed he left out this passage, and they criticized him for it. When he was criticized, Erasmus said, you won't find these words in any ancient Greek manuscript. If you find me one Greek manuscript with these words in them, I'll include it in my next printing. Someone discovered, quote unquote, a manuscript with the words in them, and it wasn't an ancient manuscript at all. Somebody produced a forgery. Erasmus knew this, but had already promised to add the words of someone found a manuscript with the words, so he reluctantly added the words in his 1522 edition. However, he also added a footnote saying he thought that the new Greek manuscript had been written on purpose just to embarrass him. So somebody came up with it because they loved that, the, that, those words in there. So they, you know, and uh, so he's promised to, they could produce a manuscript. They didn't, so he included them. The author says, since the Greek text of the New Testament that Erasmus printed became one of the Greek texts used to make the King James Bible, these added words became part of the King James Bible. And also because the New King James was translated from the manuscripts, the King James was translated from, that's why you see it in the New King James as well. I use the New King James, love it, okay? The author says, passages like this give us no reason to fear that our New Testaments are unreliable. In the entire New Testament, there are only 50 passages which have any sort of question regarding the reliability of the text, and none of those are the sole foundation for any Christian doctrine or belief. If 50 passages sounds like a lot, see it this way. No more than one one-thousandth of the text is in question at all. And some of those are considered, uh, they, they sometimes words were uh, uh, changed in the sense of the spelling. So that was a variant, and so they would include that. Um, but from my studies, I have, uh, I have uh, come to realize that 
Uh, it's a very small percentage of, the, of anything questionable, all right? And it affects no doctrine, no doctrine, okay? You can be confident that the Bible that you have in your lap, whether it's NIV, New King James, King James, NASB, whatever it might be, you have God's Word in your lap. And you have everything you need from God to live your Christian life, all right? Now, some people believe that it's only the King James is inspired. And I'm not going there, but I don't believe that, okay? Anyways, the author concludes, evangelical Christians may not know much about these passages, but many religious people who don't believe the Trinity, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses, do know the textual issues around this passage. Therefore, if you bring up this verse to support your position on the Trinity, well, they're going to hit you. They're going to attack you. They're going to show you how this passage doesn't belong in the Bible. It may get some people thinking who didn't understand this. That's why I'm going through this. There are Christians who are reading the King James and New King James, and they've been reading this passage, you know, these words in their Bible for as long as they've been saved. Now, all of a sudden, somebody hits them with, but they're not really in the original. That may cause some Christians to begin to doubt, well, what else is missing? What else can I rely on? The author says, uh, you know, um, it may get some thinking, well, maybe the Trinity isn't true. Maybe Jesus isn't God. Maybe it's just the invention of people who would try to change the Bible. He said, this can, this can do some real damage. That's why I'm bringing it out so you have a working knowledge of what's going on here. And finally, the author says, the text of 1 John 5, 7, and 8 should more accurately read, for there are three that bear witness, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Verse 9. <clears throat> verse nine. John said, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. John is um, presenting the case for Christ. Okay? I think somebody used that for, phrase, but... John is presenting the case for Christ. And he said, look, if in determining uh, a case in a court of law, uh, we trust the, the testimony of human beings, well, when it comes to God proving his case for his son, are we going to think his testimony is less than the testimony of human beings? That's John's point, right? And what is the testimony of God? Well, verse 8, again, primarily, he said, And there are three that bear witness, and I give testimony on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Now, we talked about this a little bit last time, but just quickly, okay, because if you're new, just quickly, uh, these three are a witness for Jesus Christ, proving that he is who he claimed to be, the Spirit, a reference to how the Holy Spirit empowered Jesus with the power of God, listen, to validate Jesus' ministry, uh, the Spirit empowered the Lord Jesus Christ with the power of God. Jesus, being God, could have used his own power, but he would have blown his mission. He had to avail himself of the same power that we have access to as Christians if we're going to serve the Lord, right? And so Jesus availed himself only of the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit empowered Jesus. Uh, it was the Spirit's uh, testimony. Uh, his, his mark of authority that Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be. Remember what Jesus said in John 14. He said, look, if you don't believe me for the sake of the words that I speak, believe who I am based on the works that I do. They are those that testify of me. So we read in Acts 2.22 where Peter said, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. So you see it there, that the Holy Spirit empowered Jesus Christ with the power of God, and as he worked the miracles and the wonders and the signs, uh, God, it was God's way of validating that this is my son. Also that he's the Messiah, because if you go back into Isaiah chapter 5 and some other places back there, God said that when Messiah comes, you'll know him because he will cause the lame to leap for joy, the, the dumb to speak the praises of God, the deaf, the deaf to hear, and so on, right? And so 
These were also signs that proved he was Messiah, but even more so, he went on to say, not only am I the Messiah, I am the Son of God. We know him as God, the Son, the second person of the Trinity. But just so you understand, Acts 10.38, uh, again, Peter said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Yes, in the sense that God was with him, uh, uh, giving witness and testimony that this is my son. And I'm proving it by giving him my power to do the work I've called him to do. So the Spirit, Holy Spirit, water, another uh, uh, giving testimony. Uh, I, I believe the reference here is to the water of Jesus' baptism. The water. How does the water of Jesus' baptism, uh, you know, testify uh, that he is the Son of God? Well, it wasn't so much in the baptism, but what happened after the baptism. Uh, Luke 3, 21 and 22 when all the people were baptized, now people are coming out to the wilderness to have John baptize them. It came to pass that Jesus also was baptized, and while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. The blood I believe that's a reference to his death on the cross. And if you remember from last time, we have two notable events that bookend Jesus' ministry. His baptism to start off his formal ministry and then his crucifixion where he shed his blood on Calvary's cross. They bracketed the Lord's earthly ministry. And guys, in both of them, the father testified concerning his son once verbally, when Jesus came up out of the water of the Jordan after John baptized him, we just quoted Luke 3.22 where the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And again, again, when G after Jesus had shed his blood on the cross and he bowed his head and dismissed his spirit, and at that moment we read, you can write this down, Matthew 27, verses 51 through 53. At the very moment Jesus dismissed his spirit, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now this was quite an event, okay? Quite an event, especially when you're talking about right there by the cross, uh, you know, you, you have the uh, a, a great earthquake, rocks were split in two, and so on and so forth. Uh, at that moment, the Father was using the creation. Of course, the Father was behind it. The creation didn't do it on its own, okay? Creation is not alive. But the Father was, it was as if the Father was personifying the creation. Remember, all things were made by Jesus. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Here was the creation watching its creator uh, being crucified and uh, beaten bloody, right? And now uh, uh, closes his eyes, bows his head, dismisses his spirit. It's like the creation itself was groaning and was weeping and cried out in, in anguish, right? And the father at that moment used the centurion uh, that was standing there to verbalize the testimony the creation was at that moment giving about this man who was on that cross, verse 54. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the Son of God. And so I believe that's what John has in mind here. The testimony of the Spirit. Yes, the water of his baptism, but because the Father from heaven uh, testified, this is my beloved Son. And then at the cross when he shed his blood, the whole creation gave testimony, which the centurion verbalized, this, is God, this, this was the Son of God. Well, forget the past tense. He is the Son of God. We don't serve a dead Savior. We serve a living Lord. 
And then John does something, guys, that hits all of us where we live, okay? John turns now to believers, those who have the Holy Spirit within them, and says to all of us, listen now, that we don't need any other testimony from anyone or any other outside source proving that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be, the Son of God. Listen, our very lives testify to that truth. A changed life is the ultimate proof that Jesus is the Holy One of God, God in human form, our Savior, who now lives in our hearts. When we accepted Him into our heart, He moved in through His indwelling Holy Spirit, and we know that. How do we know that Jesus came in? How, how do we know? You know, people say, well, how do I know I'm saved? That's a fair question. I mean, I prayed the prayer. But how do I know I'm really saved? Well, very simply, if you've really opened your heart to Christ, the Spirit of God has come in, and things have begun now to change. Right? I, mean, I Right? I mean, everyone in this room who has received Christ, we know what happened immediately after we got saved. We started to change. I mean, not everything changed immediately, but I know... When I got saved, I'm talking about immediately now. I used to work with truck drivers. I could cuss the wallpaper off of a wall. I mean, it was nothing. Okay? I punctuated every sentence with, you know, exp expletives. It's interesting that when the Holy Spirit moves in, the first thing he works on is your what? Your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the what? Mouth speaks. So that changed right away. Okay? I stopped smoking right away. Now, other things hung on. I mean, you know, it wasn't, everything didn't happen immediately. But I was ripping off gas from work. I worked for an oil company. Don't tell anybody that. I worked for an oil company. We were stealing gas for our cars. Okay? We had a whole system worked out, you know? And uh, that, that's, that, we got used to that money. I mean, we, we, you know, we weren't making that much, and that, help, that helped. You have to be able to have to pay for gas every week. Immediately, I, that has to stop. The Holy Spirit just, in my heart, I knew. I could not do this anymore. And don't you know God took care of us? He always does, okay? Um, but again, when we accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit moved in, and we know that because our lives began to change. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we were being transformed and still are being transformed. Day by day, glory by glory, into the image of Jesus Christ, the goal of salvation, to make us into the image of our Savior, right? You know, Paul said that all believers are living epistles. Back in Paul's day, they were very big on speakers that would go, there's a lot of uh, orators and a lot of speakers that would go, uh, professional speakers, that would go from place to place. And if, you know, if you were going to have them speak, we'll say maybe at your church or your little community event or something, they, they, you wanted to see their credentials. And, and they carry with them these credentials from other places they, they had spoken in. And people would sign off, oh, this guy was great. You know, and, they, and they would have these letters from men to show, look, uh, I'm an accomplished speaker. Look, I've, look at all these places I've, I've spoken at and so on and so forth. And so when Paul was going around speaking for the Lord, uh, some of his critics said, well, where's his letters of recommendation? You know, I mean, you know, who is this guy, Paul? We don't, he, nobody knows anything about him. You know, where are his letters of recommendation? And Paul shot back, I don't need letters of recommendation from men. You are my letters of recommendation. You are living epistles. My ministry, the word of God impacted your life. Your lives have dramatically changed. I don't need letters from men. I have living epistles that you testify that the, the gospel I preach is from God because only God has the power to change a life, and he does so from the inside out. The minute you gave your heart to Christ, that's when the work began, and it will continue until the rapture, if we make it to the, that point, when we will be made completely like him. We're being transformed on the earth. The rapture happens. We will go through an instant metamorphosis. This mortal will put on immortality, uh, you know, and we will become completely like him as we see him as he is. So back in 1 John 5, verse 9 again, 
Paul said, if we, uh, John said, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his son. He who believes in the son has the witness in himself. And again, guys, just as we said, uh, once a person puts their faith in Jesus, they receive the Holy Spirit, who now becomes, listen, the inner confirmation that Jesus is the Son of God who has now made us children of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 16, Paul said, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. This even works from my spirit to your spirit. What do you mean? Years and years ago, we were on a family vacation in California, and uh, we all went to uh, Knott's Berry Farm, if you've ever been there, right? Uh, and back in those days, those candles were popular that they would twist with, you know, and they make these candles. They were all twisted and beautiful, and, you know. So I'm watching this guy twisting candles, okay? And I'm just, I mean, he's got no Christian T-shirt on. He's got nothing on the little table he's working off of that would indicate anything that he was a Christian. But the Spirit of God said, this guy is a Christian. The Spirit in me bore witness that this man knew the Lord. So then I started to look for evidence. And I picked up one of his candles, and he had a little tag hanging off the candle, and it was a little kind of a, a little booklet you open up. I opened it up, John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. There you go, okay? The Spirit of God bears witness that, first of all, we are children of God. I know that the devil tries to get a lot of new Christians to doubt, right? But again, look at the changes. If the Lord is in your heart through the Holy Spirit, there's going to be changes, not just outward changes, like I expressed, giving up smoking, drinking. Yeah, sure. There's going to be inward changes, though. Your worldview changes, what you value before I got saved, I wanted to open up a liquor store and a, a deli, okay? Either one of those. And uh, and uh, just about ready to, my father and I were going to, we started looking for space to rent to open up a liquor store or a deli, okay? And we went right down to the new strip mall down the block from our house just being built. And we thought, here we go, right? And uh, I walked up to one of the stores, wasn't occupied yet because it was still in the construction, had a big sign out in front that said, coming soon. Cove Liquor and Deli. Can you believe that? That was the Lord saying, no, it's not going to be a lick. I wasn't saved yet, but the Lord knew what was going to happen. You're not going to be on a liquor store or a deli. All right? So I gave up that dream. Back then I quit easily. But, uh, but it's just amazing, right, what uh, the Lord does and how. And, and this is the thing. When I look back at my life before Christ, well, I was a different person back then. I'm a new creation now. And if you doubt whether you know the Lord, ask, no, you're not all that you want to be. None of us are. But are you still what you once were? Well, no, I'm not. Then you're a work in progress. And he who has begun a good work will see it all the way through to completion. Okay? All the way through to completion. So verse 10, he who believes in the Son has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Now listen. John makes it very, just a very simple statement. If an unbeliever rejects everything the Father has testified about his Son in the pages of Scripture, well, they're essentially calling God a liar. Okay? On the other hand, if they do believe the testimony of God, and I'm thinking of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Scripture, because all of them gave testimony of who Jesus is, is, was back then, is. That became the outward testimony, the scriptures, okay? The outward testimony 
Uh, and if a person believes that outward testimony of Father, Son, Holy Spirit concerning Jesus Christ at that moment, the Spirit moves into their heart, and now they have the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit. We just talked about that. Of course, this inner testimony is the result of, listen, the new life that we now have, eternal life inside of us, uh, that we now have uh, in Christ a new heart. Uh, we now have a new nature, of course. Uh, 2 Peter 1.4, the divine nature. We, we become partakers of the nature of God, right? Uh, and as such, we have new attitudes, new desires. Who in this room before you got saved wanted to come to church on a Wednesday night and study the Bible? Okay. Uh, I would dare say probably none of you. I know I didn't. Okay. You would have told me back in my drinking days that uh, at one point I'd be up here preaching, first of all, uh, or at very least I'd be in church, uh, you know, all the time and not drinking anymore and, and smoking or whatever. I would have thought you were crazy. But that's the transformation that takes place when you accept Christ. The, Spirit of God moves in. How do we know He has moved in? Because we have new attitudes, new desires. Uh, I don't want people think you know, I don't want to be a Christian because you guys can't have any fun. Why do you say that? Well, you know, you can't go out drinking and partying and you know sleeping around, so on. You know, that's fun. Uh, no, that's death. Uh, masquerading is fun. Okay. Um, besides that, I'm not. Forcing my, restraining my, oh, I want to go to a party so bad. I, oh, I want to have a fifth. I mean, I'm not restraining myself from all those things. I don't have a desire to do those things anymore, you know? And, and you know, how do you explain that except God is now inside. And he's working from within, giving new attitudes, new desires. Of course, the fruit of the Spirit is being born now, all right? Uh, author Warren Worsby said, and I quote, the Spirit was given to bear witness of Christ. Remember in uh, John 15, verse 26, and then chapter 16, verse 14, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, he said. He won't testify of himself, he'll testify of me. That's the Spirit's ministry, to testify to the people of this world that Jesus is real, that he is the Son of God, and so on. Once we accept Christ, the Spirit moves in to our hearts now. But the testimony doesn't stop. Okay, he continues to work within us. He said, Worsby said, we can trust the Spirit's witness because the Spirit is truth, 1 John 5, 6. We are, we are not present, or excuse me, we were not present at the baptism of Christ or at his death, but the Holy Spirit was present. The Holy Spirit is the only person active on earth today who was present when Christ was ministering here. The witness of the Father is past history. But the witness of the Spirit is present experience. See, that's why I say the Spirit continues to bear witness to your heart that Jesus is real. How? Through your experiences with Him. You know, the love and, and just the, the fellowship and you feel His presence and just all these things that He's alive and you, there's, there's this relationship. It's not going to church and, uh, like I used to do as a Catholic and did just, you know, interacted with uh, statues and stained glass windows and incense, thinking that I was coming in contact with God. That wasn't coming in contact with God at all. That was religion. As a Christian, I have a relationship. The Spirit of God is inside now. And wow, I mean, some people think, well, I'm, I'm not, you know, you're, you're playing church. I've had people say that over the years. You're just playing church over there at Calvary Chapel. Why, why do you say that? Because you don't have a building. You're meeting in this room here, you know? I mean, there's no statues, there's no stained glass windows. You can't call this a church. Well, you can if you look at the people as the church and not the building. Okay? That building is not the church. And it gives people the illusion they're in God's presence with all the statues and stained glass windows and whatever else. Those are props to get people to feel like they're in the presence of God. And you have, to, you have to be born again to know what I'm, I'm talking about. I know you guys do. Once you receive Christ, you don't need props. You have the God of the universe inside your heart. Okay? I mean, and so wherever we go is church. Because God's with us. We're, we're a living holy of holies, if you want to put it that way. And everywhere we go is holy ground. Everywhere we go is church. And, and we should really realize that. 
it's not church here on Sunday morning, and then out at work you can tell the dirty jokes around the water cooler or uh, off-color remarks or whatever it might be. No. Everywhere you go, you're taking God with you. He lives in your heart. You're a living holy of holies. Um, so we're not, we were not present at the baptism of Christ or at his death, but the Holy Spirit was present. The Holy Spirit is the only person active on earth today who was present when Christ was ministering here. The witness of the Father is past history. The witness of the Spirit is present experience. The first is external. The second is internal. And both agree. Back to 1 John 5, verse 11. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. It reminds us of John's gospel, chapter 1, verse 4. In him, Jesus, in him alone was life, eternal life. John three thirty six. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him, on her. Okay? In saying this, and I'm thinking of 1 John 5, verse 12, where John said again, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now, John here is not talking about physical life. We know that because he uses the Greek word zoe. And zoe refers to spiritual life, eternal life. Whereas the Greek word bios, from which we get our word biology, refers to uh, physical life. Our English word biology comes from that Greek word. Eternal life, zoe, listen guys, very basic. We've talked about this many times. Eternal life, Zoe, isn't just a quantity of life. Please understand that. It's a quality of life. The thing that makes eternal life so wonderful and appealing is not its quantity, that it's never-ending, but its quality. The Greek word means life in all of its fullness and blessing and joy I mean, when you think about life, and of course, different people have different views of life depending on if they're healthy, if they've lost a loved one, if something else is happening in their life. If you think of life, the, the greatest time in life you've ever had, the most joy, the most blessings, the most fullness, and multiplied that, I don't know, a billion times a billion in heaven starting, though, right here on earth, a little preview, a little foretaste. That's Zoe life. That's Zoe life. Eternal life, guys, wouldn't be appealing if it simply meant life or living forever. I mean, if that life was painful, hopeless, empty, I mean, people in hell will live forever, but that's not going to be a blessing, right? Sometimes we think eternal life is a blessing because it's life for eternity, but how about if you walked into a hospital room with somebody that you knew very well that was basically uh, kept alive by machines, couldn't move, couldn't feed themselves, was conscious, but, but completely incapacitated, and you walked up and whispered in their ear, how would you like to live forever? And they're thinking, what, like this? What, are you crazy? I'm praying for death. That's the only hope I have to be released from this horrible existence, right? When the Lord Jesus talks about eternal life, which is only in him, the only way to have the life of God, that's what we're talking about, is to have God inside of us, who then gives us his life, right? That's what being born again is all about. We accept Christ, the Spirit of God moves in, and now God fills us. And as God has filled us, God the Spirit, He is giving to us the life. We are drawing from His life. That's why we can now begin to bear the fruit of the Spirit. We couldn't do that 
before God lived inside of us because the fruit of the Spirit is simply the attributes of God's nature. You have to have God inside of you to bear those attributes or those that fruit. That's what being born again is all about, right? And the idea is that living forever would not be a blessing if it was not tied to the fact that it's living in God, it's living the life of God within us for all eternity. And once we shed these bodies of death and we have our new glorified body, that's when this life that we talk about, Zoe life, is going to reach its climax, its, its fulfillment. And we are, in, of course, in God's presence, there is fullness of what? So once we're on the way up, the rapture, right? It won't be a, a long trip, by the way. Uh, once we're on the way up, a microsecond, a twinkling of an eye, we're going to receive a new glorified body. We're going to jettison this old body of death as Paul talked about, this carcass that we have to drag around with us because once we get saved, we get a, a new man, but the old man doesn't go away. He's still there. And we're not going to get rid of that joker until the rapture happens. And then I will be made like him as I see him as he is. I can't even imagine an existence. I mean, think about this fallen body that is wearing out. Amen? Amen. Paul said, you know, I, this, this earthly body is, uh, is dying. Uh, I, I realize that every morning I get up. You know, I mean, I got to basically resurrect myself, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, call the paramedics and just breathe some life into me so I can start my day. Um, can you imagine an existence where there's no more pain? There's no more sorrow. There's no more emotional anger or fear. All of that's gone. And all you have is an existence, first of all, a body that is nothing but filled with joy. It's, it's complete. It we'll never get sick. We'll never uh, shed a tear. We'll never die. And then you're in the presence of Jesus, the God Almighty, in his presence, his fullness of joy. Now you, begin to, now you begin to understand what Paul meant when he said, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. We're getting a little preview right now, but it has nothing compared to what's coming, right? Spiritual life is to have your resurrected, spiritual life is to, is, is to have your spirit resurrected. That's what it means to be born again. And then connected to God through the Holy Spirit. And um, in short, again, it's to have the life of God within us through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Remember what Jesus said to the woman by the well in John 4. If you drink of the water of this well, you'll thirst again. If you drink the water that I give. And he wasn't talking about literal water, right? He's talking about himself. You'll never thirst. It will be like an eternal spring bubbling up from within in you unto eternal life. All right, we'll close with this. I told you we probably weren't going to finish, all right? But there's too much left to r rush through. But I just want to read verse 13, and we'll pick it up at this verse next time. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, there's a lot there that's important, okay? Uh, we'll talk about that next time. I just want to uh, close by mentioning, remember we uh, started the epistle. Uh, we said that, um, uh, that there were uh, four things, four reasons that John wrote this epistle. And four times in this epistle, he says, these things I write to you or these things I have written to you. That's a good little um, uh, little game to play. Uh, read the epistle and find where they are. Of course, I'm going to give them to you right now, but you can play that game with somebody else who doesn't know where they are. All right? Tease them a little bit. Okay. But here they are. These are the four. These things I write to you I, for these reasons. First of all, that, you may, that your joy may be full. Uh, chapter 1, verse 4. That you may not... Sin, chapter 2, verse 1, that you be not deceived. That's a big one today. Chapter 2, verse 26, 
And then finally, right here in 1 John 5, 13, that you may know that you have eternal life. That's a big one. And uh, don't want to rush through it. We'll look at it next time. And we will finish uh, next time, God uh, willing. But we w- looks like we will. And um, so let's... Uh, and then, of course, Revelation is going to be happening uh, in about uh, five, six weeks. Okay. Middle of, middle, of Jan- middle, middle of February. So get the word out. Okay. We'll be starting Revelation. And uh, we couldn't pick a better time, right? Uh, I think. So uh, let's pray. Father... We thank you, Lord, that you have given us eternal life through our Savior. And Lord, you sustain us, you feed us by your word and through your spirit. And give us grace, Lord, to draw from your life every day, moment by moment of every day. As we do, we will draw strength, nourishment as we read the word. We will draw power for victory. We will become more and more fruitful. And Lord, we just pray that this year would be a year of great revival in our hearts and in our church. So we thank you, Lord. We ask you to to continue to bless these studies in your word. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.